This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. Sleep no more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. Thank you, Ben. You know, mankind has always enjoyed a good story. It was that way in the beginning when our ancestors gathered around campfires to hear the accounts of adventures. Today we can enjoy the finest tales ever written, the result of thousands of years of experience. And we don't gather around the campfire, but around the radio. The first story I want to tell you tonight was written by Anton Chekhov. It's about a man who bet another man two million dollars that he couldn't spend 15 years in jail. It's entitled, The Bet. It was a dark autumn night. The old banker was pacing from corner to corner of his study, recalling to his mind the party he gave in the autumn 15 years before. There were many clever people at the party and much interesting conversation. They talked, among other things, of capital punishment. In the discussion, the host said, Well, I uh, myself have experienced neither capital punishment nor life imprisonment. But if one may judge on the basis of logic then, in my opinion, capital punishment is more moral and more humane than imprisonment. Execution kills instantly. Life imprisonment kills by degrees. <laughs> who is the more humane executioner? One who kills you in a few seconds, or one who draws the life out of you incessantly for years? <laughs> they're both equally immoral, said one of the guests, because their purpose is the same, to take away life. The state is not a god. It has no right to take away that which it cannot give back if it should so desire. Well, among the company was a lawyer, a young man of about 25. On being asked his opinion, he said, oh, capital punishment and life imprisonment are equally immoral. But if I were offered the choice between them, I would certainly choose the second. It's better to live somehow than not to live at all. Well, the banker suddenly lost his temper and banged his fist on the table. And turning to the young lawyer, he said, it's a lie. I'll bet you two million you couldn't stick in a cell even for five years. Well, if you mean it seriously, then I bet I'll stay not five, but fifteen. Fifteen! Done! Gentlemen, I stake two million. Agreed. You stake two million, and I my freedom. So, this wild, ridiculous bet came to pass. The banker, who at the time had too many millions to count, spoiled and capricious, was beside himself with rapture. And now, after 15 years, the banker, pacing from corner to corner, recalled all this and asked himself, Why did I make this bet? What's the good? The lawyer's lost 15 years of his life, and if I pay the two million, I'm ruined. Will it convince people that capital punishment is worse or better than imprisonment for life? No, no. It's all stuff and rubbish. 
On my part, it was the caprice of a well-fed man, and the lawyer's pure greed for gold. He recollected further what had happened at the time the bet was made. It was decided that the lawyer must undergo his imprisonment under the strictest observation in a garden wing of the banker's house. It was agreed that during the entire period, he would be deprived of the right to cross the threshold, to see living people, to hear human voices, and to receive letters and newspapers. He was permitted to have a musical instrument, to read books, to write letters, to drink wine and smoke tobacco. By the agreement, he could communicate, but only in silence, with the outside world through a little window especially constructed for this purpose. Everything necessary, books, music, wine, he could receive in any quantity by sending a note through the window. The agreement provided for all the minutest details, which made the confinement strictly solitary, and it obliged the lawyer to remain exactly 15 years from 12 o'clock of November 14th, 1870, to 12 o'clock of November 14th, 1885. The least attempt on his part to violate the conditions to escape if only for two minutes before the time freed the banker from obligation to pay him the two millions. During the first year of imprisonment, the lawyer, as far as it was possible to judge from his short notes, suffered terribly from loneliness and boredom. From this wing, day and night, came the sound of the piano. He rejected wine and tobacco. Wine, he wrote, excites desires and desires of the chief foes of a prisoner. Besides, nothing is more boring than to drink good wine alone, and tobacco spoils the air in the room. During the first year, the lawyer was sent books of a light character, novels with complicated love interests, stories of crime and fantasy, comedies, and so on. In the second year, the piano was heard no longer, and the lawyer asked only for classics. In the fifth year, music was heard again, and the prisoner asked for wine. Those who watched him said that during the whole of that year, he was only eating, drinking, and lying on his bed. He yawned often and talked angrily to himself. Books he didn't read. Sometimes at night, he would sit down to write. He would write for a long time and tear it all up in the morning. More than once, he was heard to weep. In the second half of the sixth year, the prisoner began zealously to study languages, philosophy, and history. He fell on those subjects so hungrily that the banker hardly had time to get books enough for him. In the space of the next four years, about 600 volumes were bought at his request. It was while that passion lasted that the banker received the following letter from the prisoner. My dear jailer, I am writing these lines in six languages. Show them to experts. Let them read them. If they don't find one single mistake, I beg you to give orders to have a gun fired off in the garden. By the noise, I shall know that my efforts have not been in vain. The geniuses of all ages and countries speak in different languages, but in them all burns the same flame. Oh, if you knew my heavenly happiness now that I can understand them. The prisoner's desire was fulfilled. In the garden, by the banker's order, two shots were fired. Later on, after the tenth year, the lawyer sat immovable before his table and read only the New Testament. The banker found it strange that a man who in four years had mastered 600 erudite volumes should have spent nearly a year in reading one book, easy to understand and by no means thick. The New Testament was then replaced by the history of religions and theology. During the last two years of his confinement, the prisoner read an extraordinary amount, quite haphazard. Now he would apply himself to the natural sciences. Then he would read Byron or Shakespeare. Notes used to come from him in which he asked to be sent at the same time a book on chemistry, a textbook on medicine, a novel, and some treatise on philosophy or theology. He read as though he were swimming in the sea among broken pieces of wreckage, and in his desire to save his life was eagerly grasping one piece after another. The banker recalled all this and thought, hmm, Tomorrow... Twelve o'clock, he receives his freedom. A 
Under the agreement, I shall have to pay him two millions. And if I pay, it's all over with me. I'm ruined forever. Fifteen years before, he had too many millions to count, but now he was afraid to ask himself which he had more of, money or debts. He decided that the only escape was to kill his prisoner before the two millions had been won. The clock had just struck three. The banker was listening. In the house, everyone was asleep, and you could hear only the frozen trees whining outside the windows. He took out of a safe the key to the door, which had not been opened for 15 years, put on his overcoat, and went out of the house into the garden where the prison was located. In the prisoner's room, a candle was burning dimly. The prisoner himself sat at the table. Only his back, the hair on his head, and his hands were visible. Open books were strewn about on the table, the two chairs, and on the carpet near the table. Five minutes passed, and the prisoner never once stirred. Fifteen years' confinement had taught him to sit motionless. The banker tapped on the window, but the prisoner made no movement in reply. Then the banker cautiously tore the seals from the door and put the key into the lock. The rusty lock gave a hoarse groan, and the door creaked. The banker expected instantly to hear a cry of surprise and the sound of steps. Three minutes passed, and it was as quiet inside as it had been before. He made up his mind to enter. Before the table sat a man unlike any ordinary human being. He looked almost like a skeleton with tight-drawn skin with long, curly hair like a woman's and a shaggy beard. The color of his face was yellow, of an earthy shade. The cheeks were sunken, the back long and narrow, and the hand upon which he leaned his hairy head was so thin and bony that it was painful to look upon. His hair was already silvering with gray, and no one who glanced at the senile emaciation of the face would have believed he was only 40 years old. On the table before his bended head lay a sheet of paper on which something was written in a tiny hand, and the banker thought, oh, Poor devil, he's asleep and probably seeing millions in his dreams. Why, well, I have only to take and throw the half-dead thing in the bed and smother him a moment with the pillow, and the most careful examination would find no trace of unnatural death. But uh, first let me read when he's written. The banker took the sheet from the table and read... Tomorrow, at 12 o'clock midnight, I shall obtain my freedom and the right to mix with people. But before I leave this room and see the sun, I think it necessary to say a few words to you. On my own clear conscience and before God who sees me, I declare to you that I despise freedom, life, health, all that your books call the blessings of the world. For 15 years, I have diligently studied earthly life. True, I saw neither the earth nor the people... But in your books I drank fragrant wine, sang songs, hunted deer and wild boar in the forests, loved women and beautiful women like clouds ethereal, created by the magic of your poet's genius, visited me by night and whispered to me wonderful tales which made my head drunken. In your books I climbed the summits of Elbers and Mont Blanc and saw from there how the sun rose in the morning and in the evening suffused the sky, the ocean, and the mountain ridges with a purple gold. Your books gave me wisdom. All that unwearying human thought created in the centuries is compressed in a little lump in my skull. I know that I am cleverer than you all. And I despise your books, despise all worldly blessings and wisdom. Everything is void, frail, visionary, and elusive as a mirage. Though you be proud and wise and beautiful, yet will death wipe you from the face of the earth like the mice underground. And your prosperity, your history, and the immortality of your genius will be as frozen slag burned down together with a terrestrial globe. You are mad and gone the wrong way. You take falsehood for truth and ugliness for beauty. Well, you would marvel if suddenly apple and orange trees bear frogs and lizards instead of fruit, and if roses should begin to have the odor of a sweating horse. So do I marvel at you, who have bartered heaven for earth. I do not want to understand you. That I may show you indeed my contempt for that by which you live. I waive the two million of which I once dreamed of as paradise, and which I now despise. 
that I may deprive myself of my right to them, I shall come out of here five minutes before the stipulated term and thus shall violate the agreement. When he had read, the banker put the sheet on the table, kissed the head of the strange man, and began to weep. He went out of the wing. Never at any other time, not even after his terrible losses on the exchange, had he felt such contempt for himself as now. Coming home, he lay down in his bed, but agitation and tears kept him a long time from sleeping. The next morning, the poor watchman came running to him and told him that he had seen the man who lived in the wing climb through the window and into the garden. He had run to the gate and disappeared. The banker instantly went with his servants to the wing and established the escape of his prisoner. To avoid uh, unnecessary rumors, he took the paper with the renunciation from the table and on his return, locked it in his safe. You are listening to Sleep No More with Nelson Olmsted. The tale he has just told was The Bet by Anton Chekhov. What's our second story for tonight, Mr. Olmsted? If I were to choose among the many short stories that I've read, the one which has the most poignant memory for me, it would be this next story I want to tell you tonight, Ben. Written by George Moore, it's about a poor bank clerk who falls in love with a woman he never sees. It's entitled... The Clerk's Quest. For 30 years, Edward Dempsey had worked low down on the list of clerks in the firm of Quinn and Wee. He did his work so well that he seemed born to it. And it was felt that any change in which Dempsey was concerned would be unlucky. Managers had looked at Dempsey doubtingly and had left him in his habits. New partners had come into the business, but Dempsey showed no signs of interest. He was interested only in his desk. There it was by the dim window. There was his pen wiper. There was the ruler. There was the blotting pad. Dempsey was always the first to arrive and the last to leave. Once in 30 years of service, he had accepted a holiday. It had been a topic of conversation all the morning, and the clerks tittered when he came into the bank in the afternoon, saying he'd been looking into the shop windows all the morning and had come down to the bank to see how they were getting on. An obscure, clandestine, taciturn little man, occupying in life only the space necessary to bend over a desk, and whose conical head leaned to one side as if in a token of his humility. It seemed that Dempsey had no other ambition than to be allowed to stagnate at a desk to the end of his life. That this modest ambition would have been realized had it not been for a slight accident, the single accident that had found its way into Dempsey's well-ordered life. One summer's day, the heat of the areas rose and filled the open window, and Dempsey's somnolescent senses were moved by a soft and suave perfume. At first he was puzzled to say from where it came. And then he noticed that it came from a bundle of checks that he held in his hand. And then that the perfume paper was a pale pink check in the middle of the bundle. He'd hardly seen a flower for 30 years and couldn't determine whether the odor was that of mignonette or honeysuckle or violet. But at that moment, the checks were called for and he handed them to a superior and with a cool hand and clear brain continued to make entries in the ledger until the bank closed. That night, just as he was falling asleep, a remembrance of the insinuating perfume returned to him. He wondered whose check it was and regretted not having looked at the signature. And many times during the succeeding weeks, he paused as he was making entries in the ledger to think if the haunting perfume were rose, lavender, or mignonette. It wasn't the scent of rose, he was sure of that. And a vague swaying of the hope began... And when the same sweet odor came again, he knew now it was the scent of heliotrope, his heart was lifted and he was overcome in a sweet, possessive trouble. He searched for the check amid the bundle of checks, and finding it, he pressed the paper to his face. The check was written in a thin, feminine handwriting and was signed, Henrietta Brown. 
and the name and handwriting were pregnant with occult significances in Dempsey's disturbed mind. His hand paused amid the entries, and he grew suddenly aware of some dim, shadowy form, graceful and sweet-smelling as the spring, moist shadow of wandering cloud, emanation of earth, or her woman herself. Dempsey pondered, and his absent-mindedness was noticed and occasioned comment among the clerks. For the first time in his life, he was glad when the office hours were over. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to think. He felt he must abandon himself to the new influence that had so suddenly and unexpectedly entered his life. Henry Etta Brown. The name persisted in his mind like a half-forgotten, half-remembered tune. And in his effort to realize her beauty, he stopped before the photographic displays in the shop windows. But none of the famous or infamous celebrities there helped him in the least. He could only realize Henrietta Brown by turning his thoughts from without and seeking the intimate sense of her perfumed checks. The end of every month brought a check from Henrietta Brown. And for a few moments, the clerk was transported and lived beyond himself. An idea had fixed itself in his mind. He didn't know if Henrietta Brown was young or old, pretty or ugly, married or single. The perfume and the name were sufficient and could no longer be separated from the idea now forcing its way through the fissures in the failing brain of this poor little bachelor clerk. That idea of light and love and grace so inherent in man, but which rigorous circumstances had compelled Dempsey to banish from his life. Dempsey had had a mother to support for many years and had found it impossible to economize. But since her death, he had lain by about 150 pounds. To have touched a penny of his savings once would have seemed to him a sin near to sacrilege. Yet he didn't hesitate for a single moment to send Henrietta Brown, whose address he had been able to obtain through the bank books, a diamond brooch that had cost 20 pounds. He omitted any reference to himself, and for days he lived in warm wonderment, satisfied in the thought that she was wearing something that he had seen and touched. His ideal was now by him and always, and its dominion was so complete that he neglected his duties at the bank and was censured by the amazed manager. The change of his condition was so obvious that it became the subject for gossip, and jokes were now beginning to pass into serious wonderment. Dempsey took no notice, and his plans matured amid jokes and theories. The desire to write and reveal himself to his beloved became imperative, and he wrote a letter full of deference, but at the same time it left no doubt as to the nature of his attachments and hopes. The answer to this letter was a polite note, begging him not to persist in this correspondence and warning him that if he did, it would become necessary to write to the manager of the bank. But the return of his brooch didn't turn Dempsey from the pursuit of his ideal. And as time went by, it became more and more impossible for him to refrain from writing love letters and sending occasional presents of jewelry. And when the letters and the jewelry were returned to him, he put them away carelessly. And he bought the first sparkle of diamonds that caught his fancy and forwarded ring, bracelet, and earring with whatever word of rapturous love that came up to his mind. One day, he was called into the manager's room, severely reprimanded, and eventually pardoned in consideration of his long and faithful service. But the reprimands of his employers were of no use, and he continued to write to Henrietta Brown. Growing more and more careless of his secret, he dropped brooches about the office and his letters. At last, the story was whispered from desk to desk. Dempsey's dismissal was the only course open to the firm, and it was with much regret that the partners told their old servant that his services were no longer required. To their surprise, Dempsey seemed quite unaffected by his dismissal. He even seemed relieved and left the bank smiling, thinking of Henrietta with no concern for the problem of living. He didn't even think of providing himself with money by the sale of some of his jewelry he had with him, nor of going to his lodging and packing his clothes. He didn't think how he should get to Edinburgh, where she lived. He thought of her even to the exclusion of the simplest means of reaching her, 
and was content to walk about the streets in happy mood, waiting for glimpses of some evanescent phantom at the wood's depths, of a glistening shoulder and feet flying toward the reeds. Full of happy dreams, he wandered through the many straggling villages that hang like children round the skirts of Dublin. Passing through one of these at nightfall, he turned into the bar of an inn and asked for bread and cheese. One of the two rough fellows standing beside him said, Ah, oh, Governor, have you come a long way? I, I am going a long way, replied Dempsey. I am going north, very far north. Oh, and what may you be going north for, if I make bold to ask? I am going to the lady I love, and I'm taking her beautiful presents of jewelry. The two men exchanged glances, and it's easy to imagine how Dempsey was induced to let them have his diamonds so that inquiries might be made of a friend round the corner regarding their value. And after waiting a little while, Dempsey paid for his bread and cheese and went in search of the thieves. But the face of Henrietta Brown obliterated all remembrance of thieves and diamonds, and he wandered for a few days, sustained by his own dream and the crusts that his appearance drew from the pitying. At last, he even neglected to ask for a crust, and foodless followed the beckoning vision from sunrise to sundown. It was a soft, quiet summer's night when Dempsey lay down to sleep for the last time. He was very tired, and he'd been wondering all day. He threw himself down on the grass by the roadside. He lay there, looking up at the stars, thinking of Henrietta, knowing that everything was slipping away and that he was passing into a diviner sense. Henrietta seemed to be coming nearer to him and revealing herself more clearly. And when the word of death was in his throat and his eyes opened for the last time, it seemed to him that one of the stars came down from the sky and laid its bright face upon his shoulder. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? Step over here, Nelson Olmstead, and tell us about next week's story. Well, Ben, frankly, I don't know at this moment. We're considering such stories as A Passenger to Bally by Ella St. Joseph, The Flowering of the Strange Orchid by H.G. Wells, The Daring Young Man and the Flying Trapeze by William Saroyan, and many more. What would you like to hear? Whether you have a suggestion or not, join us next week and be surprised. <laughs> You have been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grauer bidding you good night. Good night.